will just give uh, Carlo a warm welcome and uh, see what happens next. Uh, so, yeah, no, it's, uh, uh, Jamie, unfortunately, uh, had, has a lot of health issues, so we can just uh, all send him our best wishes because he's a real hero of mine and uh, very influential on, uh, on my way of thinking. And since I'm not a kid, and uh, there's a lot of people, there's a nice long legacy of ideas here. And this is one, uh, one of Jamie's most iconic images. Uh, <laughs> And it's 1974, uh, so it sticks out because Jamie's really famous for stuff he did after that. But yet this is this one image that kind of transcends his other cultural uh, signifiers. And it's just shocking when you think 1974, like where did this image come from? And, and so I like these buses, it's called buses. And I kind of know where they're going, but, but where do they come from, right? So, ideas again? Do I point it anywhere? Okay, I'll do point it back, man. That's where they're going. They're going to something which would deeply impact my generation. They're going to the no future. He ends up doing all the art for the Sex Pistols, so he's the guy who put the the safety pin through the Queen's nose. He's the man who came up with this kind of. Uh, uh, ransom of lettering, uh, which is de rigueur for all punk posters afterwards, and he's the guy who wrote the lyrics to Anarchy in the UK. But where was that bus to nowhere coming from became very interesting because to me, because I love that, that this new art was dedicated to like the situationist legacy. And so I wanted to go even more old school, but I'm going the wrong way now. So, but this is classic. May 1968, Student Revolts, Paris. Uh, one of the great ruptures in the hegemony of the 20th century. Uh, literally where students and workers banded together and shut down the city and shut down the culture until they could get the changes they needed. And this one's so great now to look at it because it, it's like <laughs> art is in the street. This is, this is, this is 68. And now we're in Stavanger, 2015, and we're actually really seeing uh, the manifestation of that. Uh, so that's a particular aspect of the student revolt, of, which was created by the Situationists International, uh, was Atelier Populaire, and we'll look at some of their stuff later. But I wanted to think a little back, back earlier for this. Because you know, it was, once you start looking, we just had a, a good uh, archivist up here, and they'll, they'll tell you it's a Pandora's back box. You want to go back. So uh, thinking of the Situationist, which comes out of the Lettres, it's Guy Debord and another guy named Asger Jorn, who should be pretty famous in this part of the world, but he's a founder of Cobra and uh, co-founder of the uh, Situationist International. And him and uh, Guy Debord did a bunch of uh, books. This one is from uh, Memories, 1959, I think. And this is uh, from Fund de Copenhagen, 1957. And this is the kind of art that they were doing for this writing which would emerge, which would be some of the most scathing critique of capitalist culture ever done. Uh, makes Marx look like he didn't have any balls to make. <laughs> Those are the books. This is, a, this is just a great uh, Asger Jorn painting from 62. Uh, so this is like the early situationist stuff, but it's the avant-garde will not surrender. And then I got all, it's a weird little cul-de-sac that, that I sometimes hit when I'm thinking about things. but. This is Cuba Collectiva. This was 1967. This is the Cuban Revolution it is happening, and it has to be a cultural revolution as well. And they they have this thing called Cuba Collectiva, and it's a hundred artists paint this painting together. It includes Picasso. It includes I think Asgard Jorn is there. 
certainly Carl Opolis, another member of Cobra, and a, a brilliant cat. So, and then uh, all these, uh, you know, we were talking earlier about the professional, the amateur. This was some famous artists working with amateur painters as well. Uh, you know, these kind of utopian things that don't really work. And that's actually, uh, that's some of it going on. Do I have a picture of the finest thing? So that's, you know, if you get a sense of that scale, it's pretty hard to get a good picture of this thing. So you see how it is. And of course we're, oh yeah, okay, so I get kind of interested in what happens when we have this kind of people's uprising at the same time the art world's doing something else. The art world's getting into pop art. And how do they cross pollinate? This is, I love this parade. This is May 68, Cuba. We'll get over to Paris eventually, I promise. So we have this great Albert Corda photograph, right? This is uh, uh, Albert Corda was uh, living in Cuba, photographing, you know, this Cuba that before then was a kind of a banana republic for. Uh, Americans to go get drunk and gamble and uh, sing like Frank Sinatra. And uh, Albert Corda is working with models and he's shooting for European uh, fashion magazines. He's working with Vogue, he's working with lots of publications like that. And then so he starts photographing Fidel and most famously Che with that kind of style and sexing them up. And then this guy who's, oops, I went the wrong way. Right, so and I just saw it went by a, I went to a bus stop here, some comedian, like, what, what is this thing, tell me about it, do you know? It's like some comedian in town and, and they're, they're ripping off, the, you know, this has become the most memed uh, joke kind of thing, how much it's been used, it's, uh, it's as ubiquitous as the Coca-Cola label. Uh, but anyway, some comedian in town, some TV show is using this image as well, and I think he's got an N on the hat. But okay, so this is uh, this is 1968, and uh, this is Jim Fitzpatrick, an Irish cat. A lot of people working this way. Okay, so I just thought, oh, let me do this. I wanted to show you how ubiquitous it is. Okay, so on the left we have uh, the day of the heroic gorilla, which is actually what the original Corda photograph was. Uh, and but this is by a Cuban artist, uh, Elena Serrano. And then, the one on the right's really great because it's one of the best forgery fakes turned authenticated at the end. Uh, this is Warhol, it's a, now called Warhol's Che by Gerard Malanga. <laughs> Gerard Malanga was uh, this poet who uh, was part of Warhol Circle, worked a lot for him, did most of the printings. Andy was the cheapest bastard ever, right? Never paid anyone. <laughs> Gerard needed some money. He made up this piece, and he sold it to this museum in Italy as a Warhol. <laughs> Warhol finds out, and it's like, instead of you know <laughs> firing or sending Gerard to jail, he goes, fine, it's a Warhol, give me the money. <laughs> so it's now a Warhol. <laughs> That's the wrong way I go. I'll get this way eventually. So there's some, I think, Shepherd Fairy ones, the Gigante and the uh, Bay one. Okay, so, um, and they had this huge, it's really weird. It's, I don't know, has anyone here been to Havana or anything? It's, it's kind of cool because one of the things you get is like, a, you realize, how, at least coming from America, we have a lot of uh, noise pollution, visual pollution. Uh, in our of advertising all the place, and it's kind of a place they didn't really get that. So it is a really weird ur uh, urban landscape that way, because most cities have so much of that uh, other seductive and coercive stuff. But anyway, they do have these this great kind of uh, billboard thing. I love that one for Angela Davis, 1970. Um, anyway, so the. And then they had the poster stuff, uh, um, better not to be than not to be revolutionary is the one on the right. That's, I couldn't do translation the other. Um, but anyway, so it's a highly inflected with pop art thing. We didn't have this before. We, did, we, we certainly don't have it on, on the left before, before that, that moment. And then 
we're, we're going to make it over to Europe now, I promise, right? So uh, this is a really amazing magazine which had all these great writers, like a real pantheon. Been quite forgotten over time. It was called Opus International. It was out of France, out of Paris. And it was this guy, Roman C I E S L E W I C Z, Selizwick, I don't know how to pronounce it, Polish guy. And he was the art director. And he just really changed the game. So this is the, the number one and number two. This is then before 68, right? This is like early 67. And you can see the kind of work he's doing. Oops. And by uh, number three, the third issue, there it is there. And this is actually the moment where this image goes from what it was to actually mainstream attention and, and get sexed up throughout uh, the radicalisms of, uh, of the student culture. But all his work's great, right? This, like, he's known in graphic arts world. Am I going the right way? <laughs> really cool stuff. So, just wanted to show you that. There we go. That's May 1968. Number seven. Uh, and look at that image of it. The fist in the face. It's like, it's pretty, pretty fucking angry. And um, so that, that would be the issue on the stands when it happens. So then I just want to get some other weird outline stuff that happened that leads into it. It's all pretty fragmented. I'm sorry, I don't have a real thesis here. But uh, in New York, where I'm from, there was this great uh, group, uh, and well, the, the last real star of it uh, just died, so it's kind of done, but they started in the late 40s. And uh, they were called the Living Theater. And their work was, they did a lot of stuff that, like early Brecht plays, they did, you know, they brought a lot of avant-garde theater there, but they were doing contemporary work as well, and they kept on pushing content in ways that was, really didn't work well with puritanical America. Uh, they had a lot of nudism, they had, um, uh, just, they, and they got in a lot of trouble, and eventually they did this piece called The Brig, which was uh, about soldiers locked up in a military police thing, you know, um, a real Kafka-esque situation. And it really, you know, we're in the war, Vietnam, really pissed off the authorities enough that they were hounded and chased out of America, uh, ostensibly by the IRS uh, for tax, tax evasion, you know, a theater for tax evasion. I mean, how much taxes could they possibly, you know, theater tickets were one dollar for this stuff. But these are some of the, so just to show you some of the things that they did there. Uh, Leroy Jones later changes his name to Amira Baraka. He's one of the greatest. Sure, use this one stuff. Oh, sure. Uh, Amira Baraka, you know, becomes one of the great voices of, <laughs> of uh, African American culture. Yeah, I like this. <laughs> Do some lip syncing later. Yeah. <laughs> uh, John Cage, we know anyway. Uh, John Ashbery, the great poet. Look at this. This is the you know Stan Brackage, uh, Stan Vanderbeek. Like this is beginning of uh, like avant-garde theater. It's really uh, avant-garde film. I mean. So anyway, they get forced to Europe, and they become this huge meme throughout Europe. They're based largely in Italy, but they're traveling all over. And the great thing is that th th at this time they've hooked up, they don't know he's a CIA guy, but they're working with one of the great CIA chemists of all time. He's traveling with him. He's this guy who goes by many names. In the end, we finally think his name might be Richard Stark. But every city they ever play in, they're like this, you know, they travel, they do all the street festivals, they do all the theater festivals, they're kind of traveling constantly doing these plays around Europe. And this guy's with him, and every town they hit, he's got about 100,000 hits of LSD to give out to the people for free. So they dose and psychedelicize Europe. Unwittingly, is part of government plot, but you know, such things happen. And these are some of the posters through Europe. So I just wanted to lay out that, and this is, 
in, oh, I better look this up, I, I'm really, I, in that whole discussion of earlier about professionals, I'm a proud amateur and autodidact. <laughs> so I hope I wrote down the year, yeah. 1968, so right back then is when they finally get to return to the United States. Uh, they've done their good work in Europe, and this is Promethea uh, Paradise now, rather. And uh, you can see they're still up to their 60s antics. Okay, so I promised I talked a little bit about the situations directly. Atelier Populaire, that was the name of the, uh, this huge, you know, it's probably one of the biggest, uh, it was probably the biggest visual aspect of, uh, of all the student revolts that happened throughout the world. And it was a poster program, and it just printed thousands and thousands of posters for each one. So you see them working on this one here, and that's the, the image, uh, light wages, heavy tanks. Uh, on the left, a youth disturbed by the future, and uh, I participate, and participate, etc. cetera. Uh, bowling for government. Return to normal. I mean, I, I, some of these things just ring so great, because I remember like, after 9-11 that we had this really dumb president, you might remember, and he <laughs> called it the new normal. And I was like, oh yeah, that's it. I felt like a sheep back then. Um, so the, one of the big occupations, in, in a lot of these revolutions, people kind of forget how much it's a student thing. That's why dictatorships love to shut down the universities for its thing. And then actually, that is quite often the art schools are the, <laughs> they're, they're the kids who really go crazy. So if you look at the Tiananmen Square, right, the big symbol of that was the art schools built this huge Lady Liberty, Statue of Liberty. And that's actually, that became the focal point for anyone who is in Tiananmen Square at the, at the time of the protests. Uh, it, it was the only thing you could really see. So you could, you know, like if you're at a big concert, like one of those festivals, you kind of have to keep track of that tree or that, sound tower, you know, because it's so many people. So it was like that, and it's actually where when the tanks came and ran over those last kids, that's what they were standing to, screaming like, we love each other. So in, in, uh, in Paris, the, the big occupation, the original occupation, was at the, uh, the Beaux-Arts uh, school. And so this is the police post themselves as the students, you know, the post in the street. Um, let's keep going, sorry. Uh, the struggle continues. This, I mean, this is kind of classic policeman. This is, this becomes part of the vocabulary. It's almost like a cliche of street art, these kind of things. And they put the SS symbol on them. And we are the power. So I want you to see that stuff. And then the other kind of visual evidence we have out of uh, this situation, this situation is attack that way, was the graffiti on the street. And um, uh, this is the one which, for which this, uh, this, fe uh, this festival is dedicated, right? Except it's, it's such a, you know, the Brits running this thing, right? So it, it, they did like, what did what the English call uh, the pavement? What do you call it? Pavement stones. The pavement stones. <laughs> under the pa I mean, yeah, how do they get, how do you get like that? You know, like, what's your translation of this? I say under the pavement, the beach, but yeah, yeah. Sure yeah, but whatever. Someone did like. I'm surprised it wasn't translated like under the tarmac. <laughs> anyway, uh, so this is just a beautiful bit of like magical thinking. The kind of the idea of like where in this idea of street art can it be an intervention? Can it be something which just gently slaps us out of this quotidian experience we all have, right? This, um, just somewhat take the, the blinkers off or something, just so we can see. And that's, that's the, the, you know, just to go like, yeah, under here is a beach. It's, just, it, it's such a powerful thing. This is, culture is the inversion of life. So it, what I'm doing here, I have to admit, is really wrong. Because their whole thing was like, they were really kind of against, you know, they're typical artist revolutionaries. They were kind of against art. 
because art was this fetish of culture. It was this commodity. It was all these things like that. So all I'm doing is now fetishizing their struggle, you know, and they, and they actually left very specific instructions, like for the posters, like these can never be sold. They should never be in a museum. They should never be looked at as art. These are merely, you know, the tools of the revolution or something like that. So an asshole like me is like, I'm really the enemy. So I'm just trying to speak for them, but it would have been better if Jamie could have corrected me. Uh, it is forbidden to forbid. Never work. This is a motto I followed as much as possible. Uh, create or die. And how can you think freely in the shadow of a chapel? And then below that is the power is in the street, not the poles. And then I want to show you that these are also uh, early situated. This one's earlier. This is Versailles, a great you know photographer based in Paris. This is like 61, 62, but it is a, a situationist thing because, as we know, the situations go back into the 50s. Um, and uh, and then this other one's really great. Uh, another great photographer caught this one. This is Henri Cartier-Bresson, you know, the, the, the man who kind of taught us how photography could be shot from the hip, but it was always looking for the decisive moment, as he called it, right? And to me, this is a great decisive moment because he's really photographing the graffiti, but he had to wait until that guy stood there because it's so great because what does that say? It says pleasure without limits. And it's just this beautiful contrast of a new culture and, and an old culture and very, very much at odds with each other. Okay, and so that's my little situation and stuff. And now I'm going to show you some... Okay, so there were... Guy de Borg was this you know, amazing guy who kind of really... Society as a Spectacle is still a book you could all read and take something from and think it was written yesterday because if anything, the the conditions of what, of what of which he's talking are, are even more manifest. Um, but he was a very contentious guy, and he basically threw everyone. His situations were all over. They were all over Europe. They were all over. They were in the States. And he just excommunicated all of them, always like, no, you're, you're not revolutionary enough, or no, you're this and that. So I want to show you some of the other outline things. So I, of course, I'm a New Yorker. We, think we're the center of the universe, quite rightly so. So I'll show you some New York stuff. This is Black Mask, and these are just some early issues. This is all, I guess they're kind of like 66, 67 is what I'm guessing. They don't last long. This, and this is really one of the only really uh, great protests they did. They, they really didn't last long, um, but this is, a, Larry Fink, very famous uh, street photographer, um, uh, captured this uh, black mask protest down by Wall Street in 67. So out of that, <clears throat> Splinter is something even more radical. The, the, kind of the early people behind that uh, uh, start something called up against the wall motherfuckers. And they are really great. They do, this is a beautiful piece called Garbage from 1967. That's a flyer. It's two sides of it. You can see, like, you wouldn't want me designing your website. I don't really have good graphic skills there. That's how I squeeze them on there. And it was a cultural exchange. Basically, they were all living on the Lower East Side, not my neighborhood. And they just, and the, you know, New York's a bloody mess back then. You know, it's not quite the garbage strike of '72, but it's it's a pretty messy place. And when you're in a poor neighborhood, which has really experienced the white flight, like the Lower East Side has, it's just heaps of trash everywhere. So they just grabbed all the trash they could, rode up on the subways, and brought it up to Lincoln Center, which was this great, hallowed cultural institution just being built there, which was totally wrong. It was about as wrong as the World Trade Center. And I wouldn't mind if someone crashed a plane into it either. But they did really great things uh, after that. They are um, not credited, but widely known to have been the people who cut the fences at Woodstock, right? The whole myth of Woodstock, that big festival, is like, oh, now it's free. It, was it somehow so many kids showed up that the fences just came down? No, they were situated with watches, timed, and wire cutters all around the perimeter of the place, and just at the, at the same moment just brought all the fences down. They did a great thing, and 
Grand Central Station one time where the, they, they had the big clock there and they jumped up and they just physically made the clock go backwards. Real rat, coming right out of Dadaism. Funny thing is that the leader of it, Ben Mariah, he's a kid, he, he runs away from home uh, and ends up living with a the living theater. They take him in. How am I doing for time? Very good. Yeah, very good. <laughs> 20 uh, minutes. What? 20 minutes. 20 minutes? Oh, good. Plenty of time. I might even leave room for questions. Um, anyway, so, and then he starts all these squats for kids themselves, for all the kids in the 60s who parents just don't get them, wrong side of the generation, and he transforms this whole thing. But the funny thing is he comes, he was, he was schooled by the living theater. So he's this total radical guy. Oh, my favorite, okay, hold on, yeah, yeah let's do this. So this is, this is a benefit for the living theater that they put on, right? Uh, you can see Julia, Julian Beck and Judith Molina were the two figures of the living theater, uh, two of the rad people. And that was at, is it, oh, maybe I got it wrong. Hate Parade, okay, well one of the things is they ended up uh, doing all these shows at the Fillmore East, which was kind of the great big psychedelic rock club of New York. The Fillmore West was created, Fillmore was created by Bill Graham, a real tough ass guy, if I, if I, you know, really rough. Uh, camp survivor, had the tattoos. So, you, you know, he was a good early rock promoter. He could beat those bands down and shake them down and make them play for free and launched a lot of bands that were very synonymous with the 60s. Uh, the bands that came out of there would be Big Brother and the Holding Company with Janis Joplin and Jefferson Airplane. All these things kind of came out of that San Francisco scene. Well, he opened a big club in New York, and Ben goes to him, the up against the wall motherfuckers, and he goes, you've got to do something here for these kids for free. You're charging like $3 to see Jimi Hendrix, you capitalist bastard. You know. <laughs> We need the free things. And he got people to, he got them to do it, but the way it went down was that Bill Graham goes like, look, when I opened the Fillmore, uh, the first one, the Hells Angels told me they want what they wanted for me to be able to do this. And like, I stood up to them and I said, no, no, no. And then he, pu he pulls out this drawer, he pulls out like five bullets, and each one's engraved with a, I don't know if you know motorcycle clubs, but they have different chapters. And one was Oakland, one was you know, San Francisco, one was South Salida. The five local chapters of the Hells Angels each gave them a gray bullet, which meant like, okay, you have permission to do business in this town with the counterculture. And so he shows them to Ben Mariah. Ben pulls out a gun, puts it to his head, and goes, you want yours from me now? So that's how they got to do their free nights. I'm sorry, it was such a good tangent. <laughs> uh, back to England. I don't know, I thought I had some, oh, there we go, MC5 at the film one. So that's the kind of things I got. Now, do you know the MC5? I shouldn't get off on that tangent. They're really good, the White Panther Party. Um, okay, so now, Jamie is, what, what's his relationship to King Mob? Tangential. Tangential. Yeah, they did uh, Suburban Press, which is the project that Jamie was working on before the pistols, did some Okay, there is some cross pollination. Particularly actions in uh, Oxford Street, which is doors like suffrages. Right, that's the King great King one. King they King had, King. that was, okay, so King Mob was the kind of London in the area situationist uh, group. And the suffrages, you know, we have a big department store. I'm so bad when there's actually someone in the room. I could normally say these things with authority, but I really make it up half the time. They got, <laughs> They, 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 it was Christmas time, and they got like a Santa to just start, you know, someone in the Santa outfit to just start going through the store and giving, just taking gifts out of the store and giving them to kids. <laughs> so, and so, what's the story? Oh, the, oh, the one I can't remember, I, the one I haven't seen, and you have to ask them about because I quite remember was this, you know, with the the, no, uh, the the logo for the underground, the circle with a bar through it. And there was this thing, and it was put up in buses. And it was like apologizing, you know, dear valued customer, how much we care about you. We apologize for our bad service. We apologize for our surly conductors. We apologize for charging you. Do you know this one? Yeah. Okay, because I've never, I, I, need, I need that image someday so I can talk about it. 
Anyways. Actually, uh, uh, just back to this button one time. This? That particular piece ends up by saying maybe, maybe if you can all talk to each other, <laughs> then you can get we can change things. Yes. No. It's so a, it starts off obviously in this very kind of situation is approach where it looks like an official sign, but eventually once you as you continue reading it, you yes. get the idea actually it's it's something a little bit more radical. Well, and then what it really starts out with is it really starts out in the official speak. It's like, dear value, you know, we are trying harder to please you, we, you know, but we're sorry about, you know, but it is, you're right, that's a beautiful arc of a narrative of it. And this would be the kind of thing you put up in the store and product, a lot of these strategies are, are being used by contemporary artists today and I could have done a whole talk just about that, but I did promise I'd show you some of the other people. So, G. Vosher, um, did all the art for Crass, which is a first generation punk group. Uh, founds Dial House, right, doesn't she? Yeah, so she's a uh, she's pretty successful artist now, in part because there's this artist out of England who uh, has done pretty well, and so he like makes all her prints and stuff, and it's Banksy. And so if you look at Dismaland, you have to look into the filter of the artist a certain, you know, the street artist most directly informed by the situationist movement. So that's the people, sometimes that gets lost in the translation. But anyway, G's great. These are just record covers. I'm going quickly because I want to leave time for questions. I love this. Our father on the, these are prints, so these are the kind of prints, and I think Banksy's bankroll on them, um, but that she's doing. Okay, uh, just real quick, this is uh, Gary Panner, uh, New York cat, so I like to put him in, but he was actually out in LA then. Uh, Raw Magazine later with, with Art Spiegelman. Uh, did art direction for a TV show, I don't know if it ever made it over here, but called Pee Wee's Playhouse, which was, if you ever saw it, was one of the most radical TV shows of all time. Uh, my buddy who just died, Arturo Vega, did all the art for the Ramones. Look at this beauty. So Arturo, by the way, I mean, these people are all older. Arturo is, is fleeing from the 1968 Mexican, uh, five minutes, damn. Uh, uh, the, in Mexico City, the students revolted. Of course, it was a little different because that was Mexico, so the government just sent the soldiers in and they mowed them all down. They killed over a thousand kids in one afternoon. Um, but so he's, he comes out of that, he ends up in New York in 1974, is doing punk rock there, a little before the Brits grabbed onto it. And that's a collaboration of just it's such a bad painting. But Didi Ramon was one of the, the most wonderful heroin addicts, uh, young male street prostitutes, whatever. So and lived a little longer than the rest of them until he died, but that's a collaborative painting Arturo did with him. Uh, Winston Smith, total old San Francisco hippie, but he, for the dead Kennedys and stuff like that, collage artist does all this great work for them and such great, great messages. <laughs> Uh, okay, Raymond Pettibone, a little later, this gets closer to something we call hardcore, but uh, Ray's brother is Greg Ginn, uh, has a band called Black Flag. Uh, they totally, they totally fucked with Ray's work, but he, he would take, Ray was, I had a lot of tech stuff going on, but of course that didn't work good for music album graphics, so his brother would just grab bits of his brother's drawings and art direct around them, but those are some of the famous record covers he did. Did a lot of zines. See, a lot. He did a lot of stuff about Manson. You know, kind of glorifying like the bad part of the '60s. That would be, you know, the, you think about its un, uncomfortable relationship between punk rock and, and the '60s legacies. One of the things is that just look, enjoy the negative stuff. Is that the last one? I hope so. It'd be such a good one to end on. Yes, it is. I'll let me keep it back on. Okay, questions. What's this last one? What is I, that? Oh, it's this, I, I just think it's really funny. The rigor mortis set the girls off to fits of crying and moaning. Because the guy's got a heart on the corpse. What a waste. Sorry. <laughs> you know me, I've got pretty lowbrow humor. 
I, if there's no questions, that's fine. There's a lot of information to download. So. I have a question, Carl. Okay. How does the Fluxus kind of fit into like the late 60s well, anti-art, anti-style? Um, uh, you know, uh, there's two things of, of Fluxus, and they're, and they're a little earlier than, than most anything I've shown you. Um, in, you have the European kind of model, Joseph Boyce. Uh, and, the, you know, he's really, he's kind of serious. But I'd say Machunas in New York is, you know, they, it's a little more, little more whimsical. I mean, I would have to say it has to do with humor, right? Like, um, Yoko Ono had some humor, Nam June Pike had some humor. Joseph Boyce was a, a German, what did he say? He had about as much humor as a, a Wiener schnitzel. Uh, they, I think they were countercultural by nature, but they weren't part of the counterculture. They were weird artists, right? Is that, I think that's what they were. Yeah. But they, you know, but George Machunas was inherently a criminal, and so he did do some great things. I mean, one of the things he did is he, he basically took over Soho. So the first great downtown art district that New York City has is because this guy, George Machunas, basically, he breaks into lofts, he does, bribes landlords, things like that, and he kind of like starts getting these artists in this disused space, which was supposed to have all been taken down years before. The, we had this master builder in New York named Robert Moses who fucked up the Bronx, and then like he had this idea that like, he, you know, he wanted to build cities for cars, not for people, and didn't understand the fabric of neighborhoods, so he just ripped them apart. So he had this idea that the West Side Highway and the East Side Highway should connect with a big highway between them, going right through, and he would have demolished Soho. And so people, you know, fought it enough, and then the artists took it over. And then George Machunas dies because he tries to do the same in Little Italy, and they just take a lead pipe to his head and beat him to death, basically. Any other happy stories I can relate? <laughs> um, I have a question, and maybe, maybe this is for John as well. But, yeah, um, I know that this, and it kind of leads into the next discussion, but was Jamie exhibiting art for sale during this time? Was there, was there a structure for what he was doing in, the, in a gallery, sort of private sales kind of uh, world? Not at all. Yeah, okay. No, not at all. He had been a, actually three arts. So he was very much kind of, he was, he was very, uh, very attentive on. Uh, so he wasn't coming at it totally from the left field. But as soon as he left art college, he had a choice basically to either become a, a radical artist or to become a footballer. And, you know? I know I didn't. It would be good yeah. if you'd done both somehow. But. <laughs> yeah. but, but that, was the, that was the thing. But, but there was no structure at all. And there wasn't a lot of people who could go at the time for Sheldon's work. And he, although actually towards the end of the, the free history of the press period, he did actually produce an edition print. But it was given away rather than sold. Yeah. Uh, that's the nearest you can get to that. And he actually didn't exhibit, as far as I'm aware, he didn't exhibit anything until, in that kind of context, yeah, in yeah, the yeah. gallery context, until 1980, well, January 1984. And, but I think it's important because as an earlier panel was all about kind of DIY culture. Um, of course, DIY, it's, it's from the British series of kind of self-help books, right? Do it yourself, right? Uh, that's really coined in the punk era. And part of what that was about was alternative economies. So yeah, no, he didn't really sell prints. No, he sold tens of thousands of prints. They just happened to be record covers. And yeah, so, I guess that's what I was getting at a little bit too. It's like this alternative economy, yeah. kind of like that's where a lot of these artists got their their fandom, got their their the fans that would then eventually maybe buy something from them or just know their name. Yeah. Um, and I think that's just very fascinating. Uh, I don't think Jamie ever had a, had a, a will. He still doesn't have a will to have fans in mean, that way. Right. Yeah. yeah. He has a kind of agenda. Uh, much of which is politically driven, and he's going to go for it. In whatever way that is. And it's often quite ahead of what people think they want as well. So, you know, we'll, we'll see how. Because, uh, for example, the last 10 years, he's been doing well, which almost everyone continually people going, oh, God, I hate that. And eventually, at some point, people are going to go, oh, 
Yeah, so uh, yeah, I should have shown some of his, his current stuff. Uh, he's a uh, good joke I think I made to you. I don't think I, you said I wasn't all wrong, but when people ask me, like, what's Jamie Reed up to, I say he's eating mushrooms and dancing with the druids on the beach of Wales. I mean, he's really gotten off in some really wonderful spiritual trips and uh, very futuristic and very ancient at the same time. And, but my last real connection with him, there was this great, kind of early on the world music scene, there was a band called Afro Celt Sound System, and it was really a hybrid of like African musicians and Celtic musicians, and it was really, it was, would have been better if you were on ecstasy, I, you know, that kind of music was so good. And, uh, you know, so he, he really progressed way past the kind of nihilist ideas associated with, with punk into, into really positive stuff, but, Positively freaky. Anyone else? Just, about, just yeah. about how the institutions function in relationship to some of the material you've shown us as well, because I mean, it's sort of uh, ephemera posters and stuff, and I, uh, I'm gathering like a lot of this might come from like the Fails Library or specialist archives for sort of underground culture and so on. So, but, um, well, you know, that's actually, just real quickly, before you get to your real question, it would be interesting, because Fails would never be able to have that stuff, because within, the, uh, and Fails is like the special downtown collections that NYU, New York University has. Uh, but within that Bob's library structure, there is a, an archive for radical leftist kind of stuff. And Fails is really all about sharing information, and typical of the left, the people who run on the sixth floor of that library, you can't get in there unless you you know, it's like it's a bunch of a-holes. So, yeah. <laughs> no, I was just thinking if you had any examples of how institutions would react to the material as it was coming out, because this was material that was spread on the streets, dispersed, you know, on the streets, uh, right. posters and stuff. The only thing I can think of is Moderna Museum, who had a show with the Situationist in 1969. But that was really? shut, yeah, it was also shut down. It traveled to Munich when the students got involved and called the local government for Nazis. But sort of, so it was, had the spirit of 69 in it and involved the students as well as it traveled. But that's the only thing I can think of. But I don't know if you have any more. Well, there were really resistance to, to institutions and to culture. I mean, I did see, you know, the big Jamie Reed show that New York enjoyed was at the New Museum. What year was that? That was the McLaren exhibition. Oh, was it a McLaren exhibition? <laughs> it's funny how I pace things over in my mind. <laughs> it was never about Malcolm, it was always about Jamie. <laughs> but okay, um, you know, I won't read it now, but someone that I put a quote, like in this program thing, about what Atelier Populaire said about what could be done with their posters, and they're pretty rigidly against that. So, um, the Cuba Collectiva thing, I think, traveled? German? I think we have to stop the stop that there. But uh, we could probably go on for hours now. But first of all, a big hand to call for uh <laughs>